Our first panelist today is Dr. Victoria Banyard. Um, I'll go ahead and read her introduction and then let her introduce herself a little bit as well. Um, so she's a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of New Hampshire with an affiliation with the Justice Studies Program. Um, she's a research and evaluation consultant for Prevention Innovations Research Center, and she received her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan. Um, and so Dr. Dr. Banyard will be speaking a little bit about some key recent findings and future directions for research on prevention and bystander intervention in the college context. Thanks. Um, hope everybody can hear me all right. Uh, it's great to be part of this panel. I'm looking forward to hearing what my colleagues are going to say today. It's always fun when you're on a panel because you get to talk a little bit, but then you get to learn from other people, which is great. Um, so I've been conducting research on prevention, evaluating prevention, and also understanding more about sexual assault on campus for several decades. Um, I've done work on campus climate surveys, so I'm part of a campus that's actually been doing campus climate surveys for over 25 years. Have done a lot of studies of bystander intervention, what I call studying actionists, um, and doing some more basic psychological research about what makes it more likely that college students will step in and take action, what happens when they do, um, those kinds of things. I've also been fortunate enough to work with a number of prevention specialists on campus to do several program evaluation studies of bystander intervention training to understand better what, what works. Um, and in on the way to that work, developed a number of measures for how we can assess uh, bystander intervention and taking action and how we can, how we can do that better. Um, I've also had the really good fortune for the past five years now, I think. I've been part of the Office on Violence Against Women uh, campus program office in DC uh, for a couple of years as an actual employee of DOJ on a temporary position with them. And then um, most recently with a technical assistance grant working with campuses on assessment and strategic planning related to preventing sexual assault, stalking, dating, and domestic violence. So that's me. And uh, forgive me, we're still digging out from the latest New England weather. So I'm actually working at my home office. So I will try to keep the background noise to a minimum, but apologies. <laughs> Great. Um, and I uh, wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, what are some of the sort of key takeaways from recent research on um, prevention and bystander intervention, um, any sort of highlights of, of work that you're doing there? Mm -hmm. So I think that some of the key takeaways are that uh, pr prevention evaluation has really been accelerating, which I think is been very exciting. So we're seeing a lot more evaluation studies and the more we have, the better off we are in terms of understanding what works. I think that not surprisingly, some of the takeaways from that research is that while things like bystander intervention are very promising, we still don't have a lot of data about how exactly that links, like the data mostly that we have is about whether it actually moves the needle on bystanders taking more action and we have done less to connect the dots about how that's actually influencing rates of violence on campus. So I think we have a, a long road to go with that. I also think that with, as with, you know, not surprising to SCRA members, right? When you talk about prevention, the take home messages, it's complicated. And so I think that, that we're still very much in a place on college campuses where uh, everybody wants us to be able to have the magic bullet in 50 minutes or less to figure out how to fix sexual assault. And we, it, that's just not going to happen. Um, you know, it's a complicated problem. And so I think that, that what, what I'm seeing is really promising is really thinking about how do we take a multi-pronged approach and how do we think about um, really intentionally um, creating multiple doses or engagement points for students with a variety of different forms of prevention. I mean, for example, bystander intervention often taught to first year students, sometimes a very difficult thing for them to do. They're trying to be popular community members and now we're telling them how to stick their neck out, right? So a little challenging, but I think, you know, Charlene Sen's work up in Canada, 
about some feminist empowerment, rape resistance strategies, um, showing a lot of promise with students, um, other kinds of, of uh, social marketing campaigns, Green Dot, which is much more of a diffusion of innovation, mobilize community leaders. I think that the answers lie in the synergy between all of these different things. And what's exciting is we're getting a lot of evaluation, more and more evaluation data in now that's really going to allow us, I think, to, with some intentionality, put those strategies together in a way that hopefully will move the needle. And then, of course, all the policy and advocacy work that my colleagues are going to talk about. Um, it has been really amazing to see over the last 10 years how that's really shifted and changed. Great. Um, and then you also mentioned the work that you've done on uh, campus climate surveys. Um, I wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that um, kind of next steps, thoughts on things like mandated uh, campus climate surveys. Yeah, so I think one of the things that's really exciting about what's happened with campus climate surveys is because they've gotten so much in the public eye, because they've been really talked about because they're a strategy that a lot of campuses are using. I think that um, we've taken a lot of big steps in terms of making them better um, and making better surveys more accessible. So if you think about the ARC3 survey, for example, that's at Georgia State, if you think about the Rutgers work that's been done on setting the stage for climate surveys, um, as well as the climate survey that they developed, the, the task force guidelines that came out of the White House task force, and then the, the Bureau of Justice Statistics report that they did. I think all of that has brought together people who've been really trying to study this thorny issue of how do we accurately measure sexual assault in a way that gives us trust in the data that we have. I think it's really brought people together in a conversation that has then really moved forward and um, to develop climate surveys that do, so every campus doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. There are climate surveys that are out there and if they have the resources to be able to do them, they can use questions that are freely available that are psychometrically sound and have been used on other campuses. So I think that, that all that is, is really good, but of course, then the, the real complexity is on any particular campus, to what extent are they really getting trustworthy data in terms of getting a representative sample of students and then what are they doing with the data? And that's, that's the other piece about, you know, um, particularly because I know, you know, campuses get concerned, well, you know, the first thing that, that ends up showing up is that you see much higher rates of sexual assault in a climate survey than you tend to see in um, official reports, right, for all the reasons we know about survivors' disclosures. And so thinking about how to message that and thinking also about how to try to assess that over time on campuses in terms of what that means um, and what you do with that information. And I think that's that research to practice piece that SCRA folks are, are really helpful uh, at, at um, managing and thinking about on their campuses. Great, thanks. Um, and I'm wondering if we have anyone in the audience who would like to pose any questions to Dr. Banyard um, before we move along. Um, and if you have questions that you'd rather kind of save until the end when we do more of a broad Q&A, that's fine as well. But if you do have questions, um, if you are able to access the raise your hand feature on Zoom, um, you can use that um, and you'll be unmuted. Otherwise, you can type your question into the chat feature. And it looks like we do have someone raising their hand. I'm um, wondering if we can unmute them. Someone whose name is Did Did Jiro? Go ahead, go ahead and speak. You should be able to speak now. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I want to um, thank the presenter for the work on bystander intervention is um, one of the areas that does show promises she mentioned. And she mentioned another area, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how it's great, but uh, personal safety or personal safety training. Um, and there's another area that is, that is, that is, that is, that is um, how am 
I'm, I'm starting to have a little bit of trouble hearing you. I'm not sure if you can get a little closer to the microphone or sorry. I heard the first part of what you were talking about, but not this last part. Um, so my question is, hopefully this is better. My question yeah. is, um, how can a, a school make use of uh, that piece, the personal safety piece, um, in its arsenal of responses uh, without um, raising concerns that it's victim blaming because I've, I have also seen that in, in the, uh, the literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, and I'm not an expert on those forms of, of, um, of strategies, but I, but I have close colleagues who are, and I, I think, you know, from reading their work, um, I would just really encourage you to read the work of Charlene Sen. She's out of the University of Windsor in Canada, and she is amazing. And she she is the one who's really currently publishing a lot on this. And she really talks about how it has to do with the, the kind of training that you do, that it's not just self-defense, that it is a particular form of empowerment um, and, and um, that and Chris Gittich as well at Ohio University um, does work on this as well. And, and they very explicitly in their program really address this issue of working with victims and helping people understand that it's not their fault and all of those kinds of things. So I think it has to be talked about in a very nuanced way. Um, I think that um, I think that that the other piece is also that we really where the strength is going to come is in the full multi-pronged package of prevention. So for too long, one of the issues has been that the only thing we do for prevention is try to get young women in a room and say, here's how to not be raped. When we know that in fact, no matter what they do, <laughs> it's not necessarily going to keep them from sexual assault and it's not their fault if that happens. And so I think that the other piece is what is the full comprehensive package of prevention messages that we are sending it, one of the things that's been really great about bystander intervention is really that it gives everyone a role to play and it gives everyone responsibility including administrators faculty staff like everybody should be doing something and so i think that that the main thing is that first and foremost needs to be the prevention lens and the prevention strategy that it's everybody's problem and it's everyone's responsibility to look out for one another and to create a campus where the norm is that this sort of thing is not tolerated. And then I think within that you can then you can then think in some innovative ways about how to message and add other components. But I think it's it's what are you leading with and what are you really resourcing as a comprehensive prevention approach. And my other colleagues, I'm sure, will have some other things that they might say about that. But that's just from me. I don't know a huge amount except reading smart colleagues who write about it. I know a lot more about the bystander stuff. Thank you. Um, maybe at some point, I'm not sure that I got the spelling of those names, so maybe um, at the end. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I just taped it in the chat. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, great. And I think we maybe have time for one more question um, at this point before we move on to the next panelist. So um, one more question for Dr. Banyard, and then we definitely will have more time at the end for additional questions. And Mackenzie, I realized that I think when I do the chat, it's just private and not everybody oh, can't yeah. see it. So you might need to make it so that other people can see what I just typed in. Okay. I will go ahead and read that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, if we don't have any additional questions at this point, um, then we'll move on to our next panelist and we can um, come back to questions at the end. So thank you very much, Dr. Banyard. Um, next, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Katherine Holland, um, who is a assistant professor at the Department of Psychology and Women and Gender Studies program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, and she received her PhD in Psychology and Women's Studies from the University of Michigan. Um, and Dr. Holland is going to talk a little bit about um, 
after you introduce yourself, um, about some key sort of recent findings and future directions for research on victim help seeking and university responses to campus sexual assault. Great, thanks Mackenzie. Um, so yeah, so I'm really interested in formal support systems for sexual assault survivors on college and university campuses. So thinking about the sort of systems um, and resources that are put in place to help survivors after an assault has happened. So that can be policies, reporting processes, um, as well as resources. So including things like uh, victim advocacy or sexual assault centers, uh, counseling centers, um, and so on. And so for instance, um, uh, one of my areas of work is I'm really interested in understanding the service barriers that are preventing survivors from um, uh, their, their sort of willingness and their ability to actually use those resources that are available in the community. Um, and so um, in this work, I'm really interested in understanding sort of what are the biggest barriers to care and then how uh, does experiencing those barriers um, um, sort of affect survivors' mental and emotional well-being over time. Um, also thinking about how barriers may differ depending on the particular source of support. Um, so thinking about how barriers might differ for reporting processes versus a sexual assault center on campus, for example. Um, and thinking about how we can um, help survivors connect to resources, um, and then also how we can help those resources sort of best meet survivors' needs and what they actually want and need. Um, I'm also really interested in uh, mandatory reporting policies for sexual assaults uh, in higher ed is one of my other uh, sort of big areas of interest. Um, and so um, specifically I'm interested in policies that require certain employees to report basically all information that they get about any sexual assault disclosure to the university. Some campuses also have policies that require reporting to the police, but most is definitely to like a Title IX coordinator, for example. And so um, these policies are put in place, and so these employees are required to report really regardless of whether or not the survivor actually wants a report to go forward. Um, and so um, there are sort of two different mandatory reporting roles in higher ed, and I, can I won't get into the, the sort of nitty gritties of that now, but if anyone has any questions, I would be more than happy to talk about those two different roles. But the one that I primarily focus on is the responsible employee role, and that is uh, under Title IX guidance, and they're required to report basically like all information that they have, like the victim's name, a potential alleged perpetrator, witnesses, um, etc. And so um, in this work, um, I have done some research studying a uh, sort of subsample of university policies uh, around mandatory reporting and finding that um, the majority seem to have put in place policies that require most, if not all, of their employees on campus to report any sexual assault disclosures that they become aware of. Um, and that includes faculty, staff, student employees, uh, basically everybody. Um, but what I also found is that there's actually very little research on these policies, so on their effects, on their effectiveness. And so basically we're seeing these very broad mandatory reporting policies being implemented despite any evidence really backing up uh, their benefits or their effectiveness. Um, and there is some research to suggest that they, these policies could potentially create um, a, a ch more chilly climate um, on campus, so potentially hindering reporting. And so with that, I guess I'll sort of talk about some of the areas for future research on this, because there's a couple of really big uh, gaps in what we know about university um, sort of policy uh, responses um, and sort of how they're dealing with sexual assault reports. Um, and so I, I'll highlight a couple of those. Um, so one is obviously uh, an important future direction is to have more empirical evidence um, around mandatory reporting policies. Um, so on their effects, on their effectiveness. So for example, um, it's currently unclear whether a report that's made through mandatory reporting will actually uh, result in successful investigation and adjudication, right? So is it actually going to help resolve more cases of, uh, uh, of sexual assault that are reported on campus? Will it actually help and benefit survivors of sexual violence, right? So for example, um, if uh, you know, you're a mandatory reporter and a student discloses to you and then you have to report it to the Title IX coordinator, what's actually going to happen? Will there be a successful investigation? Will there be a successful sort of adjudication of that? Um, are survivors going to be 
more or less willing to participate in those investigation processes. We just don't really know um, sort of what that looks like. And some research um, in a criminal justice context has found that survivors who are basically pushed into criminal justice proceedings against their um, will are less likely to actually participate in those efforts and it ends up then the investigation it's much harder for it to go anywhere if uh, the survivor isn't willing to participate in it. Um, and so thinking about like do these policies actually like contribute to more reports coming forward um, or on the other hand are they potentially suppressing reports and survivors are just feeling less willing to disclose uh, their assaults. Along those lines, we also need more research to better understand what survivors actually think about them. So what do students know and think about uh, uh, mandatory reporting policies on campus? And I think it's also important to think about um, the potential um, sort of characteristics that might affect what students think about these policies as well. So for example, um, I think it'll be really important to think about how being forced into potentially unwanted um, uh, you know, investigation processes may be particularly uh, traumatic for ethnic or sexual minority students who are more likely to face um, institutional discrimination in the first place. Um, I think it's also important that we then also have research on how these policies are infected or uh, affecting employees. So those who are actually being required to be mandatory reporters. Um, there's a little bit of research evidence that has come out and there's more anecdotal evidence as well, finding that um, so faculty members, for example, um, staff members, or like advocates, like victim advocates on campus are finding um, that there are sort of like practical, ethical, um, instructional, so thinking like teaching challenges to being designated as a mandatory reporter. So for example, on my campus, if I was considered uh, a responsible employee, if I was considered a mandatory reporter, I actually would not be able to do the research that I do because I would have to be reporting my participants, right? So thinking about how that can actually potentially hinder um, the, the kind of work that we do. And so better understanding sort of how this affects um, employees. Um, and so then, uh, sort of along those lines, um, institutions are required to uh, train mandatory reporters. Um, and I've had sort of questions about um, whether it's practical or even possible for an institution to adequately train every single employee on their campus um, to an extent that would actually be effective. And so I think there needs to be more research on what institutions are actually doing to train their employees um, and what are the most sort of effective methods for, for training them in responding to, um, uh, to sexual assault disclosures. Um, and so then uh, another really important direction um, for university responses to sexual assault is around the actual investigation and adjudication processes. Um, so basically, right, like once a report is made um, and that investigation is started, we know almost nothing um, sort of data-wise or empirically um, about um, what's actually happening during those processes across campuses, what those processes are like for survivors uh, or complainants is a sort of technical term, and then uh, the alleged perpetrator or respondents, and then what are the outcomes of those uh, investigations. So we see that the investigation and adjudication processes vary widely across campuses. Um, and uh, I can talk, I was gonna say, if people have questions, I can sort of explain some of the primary models that are used, but I won't get sort of into the weeds into that now. But um, we don't really know which ones are most effective which ones are least effective, and how the different processes um, are experienced by the students who are in them, right? So which ones are actually more beneficial for students and which ones aren't. Um, so for example, um, some folks have been um, critical of um, Obama-era Title IX guidance, um, saying that um, the guidance that was put forward was potentially limiting um, accused students um, due process rights. Um, you know, that they are, it's resulting in more students being, you know, expelled from the university. But we don't actually um, have data around that. We don't actually have the data to show, like, have those processes actually increased the number of students who have been uh, found responsible for sexual assault um, or um, the uh, actual sanctions that those students are then given? Um, and so, you know, right, are they actually resulting in more responsible findings and what kind of sanctions are students actually being given? And so there needs to be a lot more research around that because there's almost nothing. Um, there's been some really interesting um, research in the criminal justice field where they have asked uh, 
submitted um, a Freedom of Information Act request to actually analyze um, uh, police files, um, like basically cases in looking, for example, at different kind of characteristics that are associated with the likelihood of um, a, a report um, sort of falling out of the justice process, right? So what is the likelihood of a stranger versus an acquaintance um, assault uh, of their actually charges being brought, for example? But that information isn't available at the higher ed level. Um, you know, students' records are, are protected, and so, and universities are not um, very forthcoming in releasing that kind of data. Um, there are some exceptions with some schools releasing sort of summary reports at the end of the year about the number of cases that they've seen, um, the general outcomes, but in general, we just don't really know a lot about those processes. Um, anecdotally, we know that they're not working very well for students um, and uh, causing a lot of additional uh, trauma um, afterwards, but research on that topic is, is fairly scarce. Um, and then finally, um, I'll just wrap up by saying that I also think that um, uh, we need to better understand um, basically student support seeking overall. Um, so the, the small and growing body of research that we have on this topic finds that um, so students are um, very unlikely to report to the university um, or seek help from resources, even though they often in the campus community often have access to um, many different options um, for support uh, compared to some uh, um, groups of survivors in the community. Um, and there are very good reasons why uh, students are not reporting and using these resources. And so uh, I think it's important that we better understand those reasons and identify ways that we can um, help reduce those barriers. So for example, there seems to be very um, sort of strong uh, stigma and fear around reporting assaults to the university. Um, the belief that basically, um, nothing's going to happen like you'll report it and it'll basically be a dead and like nothing's actually going to be done um and also a lot of concern around um, um basically like backlash or retaliation from their friend groups or peers and so worrying about ostracism gossip um, etc um another um really big piece of this is that the research is suggesting that um a lot of students are not reporting or seeking help because um they because of just how sort of normalized sexual assault has become on college campuses right and one of the main findings across studies has found that students aren't reporting or seeking help because they um, don't think it's sort of bad enough or serious enough to warrant um reporting or seeking help um, and it's not that there are not negative outcomes so the research finds that students are still experiencing psychological emotional distress afterwards um, um, in some of my own research, the survivors are expressing like annoyance, um, anger, fear um, after these kinds of incidents, um, but they're also um, sort of seeing these kinds of assaults is they're not necessarily fitting this stereotypical sort of picture of real rape that we have in our minds and seeing like right like the unwanted grabbing at parties um, or uh, alcohol involved sexual assault just seeing those more as a sort of like inevitable or sort of normal part of campus culture obviously an undesirable part but something that's just going to happen and you have to deal with and so um so some people that I, i've sort of talked to are like well you know, well, if they don't think it's bad enough, then why should we care? Like, if they don't think it's bad, then why should we? And so for me, the research or the evidence that we have, it's not that um, it's not bad, right? It's really more around the community norms and the ubiquitous nature of these kinds of assaults in the community that is uh, really sort of standing in the way of reporting and, and, and seeking help, um, particularly on college campuses. And so definitely needing more sort of research to help uncover um, uh, this and, and thinking about ways that we can help sort of overcome um, um, those barriers uh, to reporting as well. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll have time for maybe one question uh, before moving on to the next panelist. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question for Dr. Holland? Okay, so I'm not seeing any hands raising. Um, one question that, oh, I do have one coming in on the chat. I'm gonna wait a second and see. Okay, um, so 
This question is coming from Liz Hutchison um, at the University of New Mexico. Um, she's still writing the question in. Um, and I'll uh, read her question out loud for those who are just joining via audio. Um, looks like she's still typing. Okay, so she says, thank you, Dr. Holland. As an expert in these studies of mandatory reporting, can you tell us how you respond to challenges to alternative models for responding to disclosures? Um, I was going to say thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so there are, right, so when we think about how you could potentially respond to disclosures and um, we're just starting to see some potential um, sort of additional ways. So at the University of Oregon, for example, Jennifer Fry to help sort of champion um, what she's calling a student directed approach where the you have a small number of employees on campus who are designated in that mandatory reporter role, but the vast majority of people, so for example, most faculty to your most staff people, uh, if they got a disclosure, then they would, their main goal would be to understand what the survivor wants to have happen with their personal information, right? Do they want it to be reported? Do they want to learn more about confidential resources? So what is it that they want? And then help that student um, connect to those services. So essentially, it's basically like figuring out what the student wants and then helping them get that, which is really more of a sort of advocacy-based um, approach, um, which anyone who's worked as a, a victim advocate, it's typically find out what that survivor wants and needs and then help facilitate accesses, uh, access to resources or whatever it is that they want, right? If they do want to make a report, help facilitate that. So it's not actually sort of stepping in and playing that, um, like, like counselor role, because um, that's not you know their job, but just helping be that go between to help the student connect to resources. Um, oh, is that what you said? Such as University of Oregon? Yes, there you go. Um, and so um, I know that some of the challenges to this particular um, approach there. So there is some concern um, around. Um, like right, sort of like liability, for example, with some of the lawyers, uh, the way that some of the guidance has been read previously is that um, it's saying that all faculty and staff members have to be mandatory reporters, but that is in fact not what the, what the law says. Um, so in, and actually schools have been required to designate mandatory reporters like a responsible employee role since uh, 97. So one of the sort of original guidance around sexual assault um, on college and university campuses. Um, and then that was also reiterated in the revised 2001 guidance that still stands. So the OCR hasn't um, rescinded that yet. And so some of the sort of challenges or worries is what's gonna happen and would a school potentially be held liable if um, an employee received a disclosure and didn't respond to that adequately because the problem is is when you have this sort of known or should have known standard if i'm a faculty member and i'm a responsible employee right and or the student thinks i could be and i get this disclosure and i don't adequately bring it forward the school could potentially be held liable and so i think that there's some sort of liability concerns that has um potentially fueled some of this um the expansion of mandatory reporting policies and the worries about using some of those more um, different or alternative approaches. And the University of Oregon um, policy is really new uh, and they are working on a more um, actually doing some research and gathering data about how well that's working or not because again we just don't have a lot of data around these policies and how well they've been working and how well they haven't. Um, and so I think that it is um, a a promising um, and certainly a more survivor-centered approach to reporting, um, but I think that um, it's also important that we're gathering the data to actually show that that is a more effective um, approach. So I would say the sort of concern about legal liability could definitely be a challenge to some of those alternative models, though. Okay, she says thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead in the interest of time and move on uh, to the next panelist. Again, we're going to have time for more questions at the end. Um, so our next panelist, panelist is Wanda Swan, um, who is the director of the RESPECT program at Emory University. 
um, and has worked at both Vanderbilt and Mississippi State Universities within the scope of violence prevention, advocacy, and bystander intervention education. Um, and she takes particular interest in grant writing, policy review, and has experience developing freestanding centers dedicated to campus violence prevention. She's a founder and leadership council member of the Campus Advocates and Prevention Professionals Association. Um, and Wanda, after you introduce yourself a little bit, um, I wonder if you could speak to some of the key sort of current issues and best practices for campus-based practitioners in implementing prevention and education programming. Sure, I would love to. Um, I am Wanda Swan, uh, and I serve as the Director of the Respect Program, and uh, very excited to be in this space today. I do uh, have to say that uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I am also, it's my week to hold the on-call phone for our office, and so I am sitting on pins and needles right now. Uh, and so there may, just after, um, there may be an instance where I may have to leave. I, I just want to put that out. Um, so the work that I do um, with uh, the RESPECT program at Emory University, I, uh, we work to end violence by ending oppression. That is our tagline. That is how um, we uh, kind of focus our work. I serve as a director, but also lead advocate. And the RESPECT program within itself uh, does have a two-armed approach of prevention, education, and direct care and service to um, survivors of violence. Uh, RESPECT has enjoyed um, quite a bit of time um, and recognition as a uh, resource for specifically sexual violence. Um, support um, and it, when I came on board, I think it, I think it'll be three years, either yesterday or tomorrow, I can't really remember. Um, but uh, when I came on board, uh, it was a very, we had a very specific focus. And so uh, coming into the space um, and working um, originally as an associate director of advocacy, I, I realized that there were um, marginalized populations that we were not of uh, servicing and that that concerned me greatly and so after having some opportunities to connect with some students um, we realized that we needed to widen our scope right and we needed to have a larger look at how um, we need to prioritize um, all forms of violence and we also need to ensure that we're casting a wide enough net with our language um, and our connections to campus institutions uh, so that students, all students can see uh, their narrative, their stories in our resources. And so that has been our, um, our largest priority this year. I think that um, we work from the aspect of, of trying to create a trauma-informed campus um, and we do that um, by offering trainings on trauma-informed care, but also ensuring that um, our signature programming, everything from our signature programming to um, our resource booklets, they're all, uh, we center to, we center the margins. Um, we um, work to try to, try to utilize uh, models of care and um, just understandings and adaptations of anti-oppression frameworks so that we are able to uh, not only support survivors uh, in their moment of crisis uh, from uh, whether it's sexual violence, or whether it's race-based trauma, uh, or whether it is any other form of violence um, along uh, the spectrum. Um, we brand ourselves as change agent trainers um, and we um, work with our, we work with student organizations, um, one being specifically sexual assault peer advocates. Uh, we work um, with student organizations around prevention. We work with student organizations who are interested to, and um, specifically uh, we have one group called the Survivor Anthology, right? And it is, we are showing our activism uh, through our, our use of writing. And so they are, uh, with the permission of students, of survivors within the community, they are allowing survivors to um, submit stories, uh, submit their stories, and they're publishing that within um, university uh, at, under the umbrella of a university student group. Uh, I think for the, 
the the largest our our large the goal is for us to create global citizens who are kind of poised uh, to continue this movement, right? This larger movement to ending violence within uh, larger systems across their lifespan. Um, our goal is also to increase the quality of life for survivors across their lifespan, um, both here uh, and uh, once they matriculate from Emory. Uh, and we, I think we work specifically also to um, dive into those areas of our campus community where uh, we don't usually have uh, quite a bit of, um, I won't say response, but we work to, we work at the intersections, right? We work at the intersections and we work to bring those narratives um, at, the, at the intersections to like uh, across campus. Um, I think when I think about some of the current issues and best practices um, in general, I, I always start with best practices because best practices, it sounds like good news to me and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning to continue doing this work. Um, so I think that when looking at some of just the, yeah, some of the best practices, practices that I found that helps to uh, both keep me here in the field and working and also um, allows us to have a connection to our students and uh, develop systems where we are not uh, throwing <laughs> ideas at our students um, and hoping that they stick. Uh, again, we center the margins, right? We are looking to ensure that there, that the voices um, looking to amplify voices that are not necessarily um, been giving space um, and, and authenticity in, in their language. Uh, we are also working to expand the scope of violence prevention to include all forms of violence. Um, and, and very similar to what Victoria stated earlier, we vary our prevention methods. We have to, right? We have to. Um, what we do, the work that we do with athletics and the work that we do with Greek life, first years, international students, right? Uh, those all look completely different. And it is important that we are tailoring our language, tailoring um, our approach uh, and, and making sure that the approach that we're given is not um, an approach that is for first year specifically like there is there is a way that we have to ease um, bystander intervention and conversations around social norming to them in a way that we we can have that conversation with with seniors who are getting ready to go out um, into uh, into society in a different ways. so we, we definitely have to make sure that uh, we also work to, to capture the landscape, the landscape of our campus community and our campus culture. Uh, so I also sit on the um, prevention, the Senate subcommittee for the prevention of sexual violence. And that has been a very, um, a very unique space for us to work to um, map out uh, and, and, and gain insight into what is happening. We actually just completed our first uh, campus climate survey ever in the history of Emory University uh, for students as well as for faculty and staff. Uh, so that was, that, that gave us great insight. We are actually, that was a year and a half ago, so we're gearing up again for our um, second run. Um, and it was uh, feedback from that campus, uh, from that campus climate survey that allowed us to see that, that some of the issues that I'll talk about, that I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes around how do we how do we have this balance between compliance and support, right? And how do we ensure that there is no overreaching um, into spaces? Um, that that is that was an issue, and that actually led to a lot of institutional change uh, that we were able to implement, which included raising the um, the uh, elevation or elevating respect program um, in looking with having a director respect program never had a director before but elevating the work and elevating uh, the visibility of the respect program so that it can uh, be uh, in a form of balance um, to our compliance office on campus um, again uh, utilizing adapting community-based anti-oppression frameworks to collegiate setting i think it's important for us to to look at what 
I think we have to reframe and restructure how we're having these conversations on college campuses. And I think that there are ways uh, that we can definitely look to um, some successes within our community organizations. I came to this field 10 years ago uh, and uh, was quote unquote raised by uh, community activists um, in the work that I, and the approach that I use um, in my work today. And so I think it's very helpful for us to ensure that that is, that we are um, working outward, um, especially in, in, in the ways in which we are looking to capture um, and include so many uh, folks in the movement to end violence. Um, understanding, we work to, to, we work to help people understand and honor the marriage uh, between prevention and advocacy, um, because it is a marriage. And um, there are definitely places where I'm sitting in spaces and uh, I have to explain to people that advocacy and prevention uh, go hand in hand uh, and that uh, any um, growth in education around prevention uh, measures could also greatly increase uh, advocacy uh, numbers, right? And, and students who are seeking support, which is not a bad thing at all. Uh, but we have to be sure that we are, um, we are not heavy handed in one place and, 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 and we're lacking in another. It is a marriage and they both have to grow together. Um, I think that um, we, bystander intervention models that are culturally competent, Right, that is something that we are uh, very interested in looking at. Uh, Emory, Emory students like to say that, you know, we don't like out of the box. We don't like out of the box. We want this, we want that. I think that um, what is important though is, and, and we do have some homegrown uh, evidence informed uh, bystander intervention programming. I think that it is important for us to tie back to these larger systems. Uh, and these larger methods. Um, one that we have that I've been looking at specifically is Chimmy Boy Keys is about that life, uh, which ha which was specifically um, created for HBCU campuses, um, and and it looks at the barriers and, and barriers to um, barriers for communities of color, right, as it relates to. Uh, interfacing with those systems that some deem may be support systems. Like what do you do when you historically don't have a good relationship with law enforcement? Um, that is not a system for you to access. So how do we, what do we do with that, right? And so uh, being able to have these multi-layered conversations around the same topics, right? So bystander intervention is, uh, we do have a bystander intervention uh, curriculum that our Greek life system, loves. Um, they are very, very um, excited about it. But when we get to our Black Student Association, Black Student Union, they're not feeling it as much, right? And so we have to make sure that we are culturally confident. We have to make sure that we're providing um, information uh, and education that is relevant to their lived experiences. Uh, Trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care, trauma-informed care, trauma-informed care. If I had my way, I tell people all the time, if I had my way, uh, every student uh, who is seeking out resources and interacts with a community member here within our um, institution, they would have to, they, they, would inter they would interface with someone who has had training and understands the importance of um, doing no further harm. Right, understanding the the concepts to the six concepts of trauma informed care, understanding uh, choice and cultural competency and safety, right, uh, and being able to uh, spread that um, that specific rhetoric throughout our campus community. Uh, we also focus a lot on life after crisis. Um, what I have come to realize working in this field is that um, university systems are very excited about if, about their crisis management systems, especially if they feel, and, and they gain success if they're able to say, we got this student from point A to point B and they're happy and, and or not happy, but they are they are moving along swimmingly. What I've what I realized is that there are not a lot of um, 
not a lot of options for students to have these conversations about life after life after crisis, life after trauma, and how do we ensure that we are giving survivors tools um, to support uh, them having a better quality of life after, um, after, after the assault, after time here uh, within the college community and, and beyond. What skill sets um, are we able to support them having, especially for those who are not interested in the traditional methods of uh, of seeking out uh, resources, whether that is uh, our counseling services, our uh, spiritual religious life uh, resources, what other options are there? Um, we also work to interrogate systems of privilege and how they balance uh, this dance of, abstain of sustaining oppression uh, and simultaneously using this language of self-care, right? We are in a self-care overloaded system and what that means um, for uh, survivors who are, especially survivors of race-based trauma, who are balancing, like, I'm, I'm, I'm living and existing in this system uh, that is oppressing me. And when I have these conversations, is well, you need to learn how to take care of yourself. So conversations around communal wellness agreements. Uh, what are we as community members? How are we creating spaces um, that will support um, each other? And as individuals, what are those things that we need specifically? Uh, and how can we bring that, put that back out into the community and we all uh, work together? Um, that's another um, area that we are, we're looking at, we are looking at this balance of uh, self-care versus self-preservation, right? And working in survival mode and what that means when you layer on um, uh, being a survivor of violence. Um, we are also working, uh, we have a brand new office of race, right? So we, it, it is this idea of looking at how do we intersect uh, various identities and how are we working to provide resources uh, to students um, who are coming to us with these multifaceted lived experiences, right? And so a piece of that is, is help working with our social justice education department, working with our Office of Race, um, and engaging the historically privileged groups and embracing cultural accountability, owning their privilege, igniting their agency. Because what we know is uh, that this when we talk about oppression, when we talk about uh, just in a broader sense, right? We have to talk about power. We have to talk about privilege. We have to talk about dismantling, interrogating, and disrupting these systems. And so that's what a lot of our uh, educational efforts go to as well. Uh, Peer-led initiatives, right? Uh, we, I would like to think that I am quite charming and. Um, a humorous person. No student wants to have a conversation with me unless they need to have a conversation with me. And I will not be in these social spaces uh, with students. Um, and uh, when there are moments, right, the uh-oh moments, um, I, when I work with students and we're training around a bystander intervention, we talk about the uh-oh meter, right? It's that moment where it's like, oh, it's rising. My uh-oh is going off something, right? I don't have a lot of uh-oh moments around students because they're on their best behavior. They think I'm old. They have no interest in me whatsoever. Uh, but how are we having these conversations with students so that when they have those uh-oh moments, right, and, and they have a, a an opportunity to decide uh, to um, be in a space and, and and support those in their community. Like, what what is it that they're going to do? Um, working outward is something like how do we use how do we create uh, systems of prevention education, or how do we connect these systems to other systems so that we can create this larger outward swell. Um, and that is coming, uh, what we're doing with that is we're working with other institutions, right? We are aligning um, languages across institutions. Uh, we're working with uh, some historical black colleges in Atlanta area. Uh, we've always had a great relationship with Georgia Tech um, and, and uh, looking at how how are we working to align our language um, and also go into those spaces and have students come here um, so that we can have those layered conversations as well. Uh, I think uh, 
last but definitely not least assessment 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 uh, we have to again we can't just throw things at students we can't throw things at them and try to see if it sticks and if it doesn't stick but it's not you know like when do we set sunset programs like there are some things that we hold on to uh because we like it it makes us feel good or we were the people who first created it and i have a tie to it how are we ensuring that our work is purposeful and that it is uh positively impacting spaces for our students or at least positively working to critique and interrogate uh and move the needle um those are my idea of best practices, right? Uh, if we're talking about issues, <sighs> I'm going to keep this very short. Um, establishing, I think one of the, I, I think there are a couple issues that are happening on the horizon. I feel specifically that the role of the advocate um, is dwindling. And I think that that is a very, um, I think there is a very specific, uh, reason for that. I think it's very strategic. I think that we're seeing now uh, Title IX overreach, and I think that that is this, um, this look um, at compliance and this overreach of compliance is one that also I think is consequently also helping to lead to this uh, doing the link of survivor support uh, I, uh, of advocacy, and especially with advocates. I think that uh, there was a specific role. I remember being in this field 10 years ago with a very specific role with advocacy and with the idea of having a student-centered approach, right? Understanding that uh, there's, there's just a lot of negotiations over student needs uh, that are happening in spaces that I feel are, are, are unsafe. Uh, like we shouldn't be we shouldn't be negotiating if a student really feels that they can't sit in a space uh, with their um, with their alleged perpetrator if they're going through a Title IX right if the student has said that they feel uncomfortable they feel uncomfortable but if you have to come back and say well do you really feel I, we don't need that because we don't need cores right so that there, there are some things that are happening there. I think another issue um, is just student engagement in general over programming, over extension of students. Um, they live so many varied lives um, and being able to engage students to take part up in the movement to end violence on a very like in the trenches level is becoming very difficult. And I think that's more of a systems issue with uh, our universities uh, over programming. And I think that there are definitely some easy fixes. What we're working to do um, here is, uh, and it's very simple and it's very sad that we are just getting to this place, but yo, it's, give me a master calendar, please. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's get a master calendar and then let's talk about all, all these places where we can combine our efforts. Um, I think uh, issues that I think administrative support buy-in that is constantly uh, in, in a concern um, when it comes to how do we implement uh, the one thing that I can say about Emory University and I tell people this all the time is that Emory is not afraid to fail. Um, you can come with an idea. You can say this is where we are, um, and and I have the autonomy and the agency to create and to be and to do this. And, but I also know that that is uh, a privilege, and I know that where I sit is a privilege, right? Uh, is a privileged space. And so, um, but I also think uh, when we look at uh, where your office is located on campus, what does your staffing look like? Uh, what type, what is your budget like? What what resources do you have to actually strategizing or bringing to fruition your strategy um, from a practitioner level? Like what does support actually look like? Uh, equitable prevention resources for all campus cultures. We're working now with the CDC uh, and I can't remember the name of the other organization. That's not good. And the Department of Georgia Department of Health. Uh, there's a, um, a call to action team and they're looking specifically at small campuses within the state of Georgia and looking at those who have a dearth of um, opportunities around prevention education and how can we work to uh, take 
taking consideration the specific culture that's on that campus, but also uh, how do we provide resources in that area? So that, that has been uh, conversations that are happening um, on the state level um, at this time. Um, I think that um, another issue is being able to embrace uh, conversations around oppression and how oppression is connected to violence in marginalized communities. I think that is a difficult conversation. I think there are a lot of difficult conversations that are happening on college campuses. And I think that there, I think that people aren't doing a great job <laughs> of having these conversations. Uh, and I think that uh, in, in the areas where we are having uh, great success in having these conversations, we, we need to do a better job of publicizing that and, and creating systems and guides so that people can have these conversations. Uh, I think there's a dearth of information on male and transsexual assault um, and education around that. And so we're looking to build that up as well. Um, we also, I, I think that um, looking at hazing as a form of interpersonal violence is another space that um, we, that I, I have struggled with um, in breaking down this box of hazing, this mysterious box of hazing, um, and sitting it and breaking it down and looking at how violence happens within those spaces and calling it what it is. I think we have a problem with calling things what they are. Uh, and so one of the things that we're doing here is that uh, we are, we have an anti-hazing uh, committee here and we are I am one of the co-chairs in that space, and that is the framework that we're going from. Um, in, in, in the vein of looking at if we're doing this sweeping language, like how are we aligning all of these different forms of violence in our approach to them? And I think lastly, um, we look at our work uh, from the standpoint of melting the iceberg as opposed to chipping away at the iceberg. Uh, so the iceberg of oppression is this theory that I have been toying with and working with, and again, Thank you, Emery, they give me the opportunity to, to kind of play with this. Uh, but it's looking at um, violence within specific communities, right? In every community, specifically with, with college campuses, there is, uh, they, there is a form of violence that is pri prioritized, and that is a piece of sticking out of the water, right? And that is sexual violence. And even under that umbrella of sexual violence, we, all, we know that there are still some priorities there. Uh, and there are some other forms of sexual violence that are not as prioritized, right? But below the surface, we know that there are other forms of violence, the, uh, the microaggressions, we you know, uh, homophobia, transphobia, uh, that are happening beneath the surface, um, that are not getting that attention. And so how do we, how do we work to uh, melt this iceberg and so chipping it away? Um, again, if we're using the, um, if we're using hazing as an example, right? Um, if we're talking about hazing and hazing, an act of hazing is happening somewhere on campus. Uh, if we're calling it hazing, we're wrapping it up in a box of hazing. Uh, there are times where those who may be impacted by that may not be able to seek out resources from the area on campus that is designed to help survivors because it's called hazing. It's not called this, right? And there's like, there's no dotted line. Um, and there are times where those are those are those are students that I that we that we miss that we don't have an opportunity to support right so and then when you add on top of that uh, there could also be instances where these aren't necessarily are handled properly right and it is the equivalent I think of chipping away at the iceberg instead of having a multifaceted approach to actually uh, trying to melt the iceberg and looking at the policies and uh, using um, the anti-hazing committee and, and, your, and your specific um, entities across campus uh, in a combined effort. I think that that's, that's an issue that's also happening. Um, so how, how do we melt this iceberg? How do we work together instead of chipping away and creating other icebergs? Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Ooh, that's a lot. I'm gonna take some water here. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, and we will uh, take just one quick question in the interest of time, and then we'll take additional questions at the end. But does anyone have um, a question? I see one hand raised. I just promoted him to a panelist instead of allowing him to talk, but that's okay. It'll work. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, if you want to go ahead and unmute your microphone, um, looks like W312935 username. Okay, go ahead and pose your question. Hmm. I'm not seeing them as a panelist anymore. Um, could you try uh, typing your question into the chat box if you are able to do that? I don't think oh, I there you are. Okay. No, I don't think they're on anymore. Oh, okay. Looks like we may have lost that person. Oh, it looks like they're back on. Um, and maybe we can come back to their question at the end. If you want to type your question into the chat box, if you're able to do that, um, we can take your question at the end, just in the interest of, of time. OK, so we'll go ahead and move on now to our final panelist. Um, So our final panelist today is Wagatwe Wanjuki, um, and she is a writer, activist, speaker, and social media campaigner at Daily Kos, who first got her start blogging and organizing for social change as a co-organizer of the movement at Tufts University for an improved sexual assault policy. As a survivor turned activist, she uses her experience to help the most disempowered to use the power of new media to raise the voices of the most marginalized. Um, and so, Wagatwe, if you could uh, introduce yourself a bit and then speak a little bit to what are some kind of big picture next steps for activism on campus sexual assaults, um, given everything from what we're seeing from the Department of Education to um, the Me Too movement that's going on right now, there's obviously a lot. Um, so what are sort of your uh, takeaways for next steps on this issue? Yeah, um, so I am Wagatwe and I have been, I was a survivor of, or I am a survivor of campus sexual assault um, way before a lot of this has been happening. And so um, I'm one of the co-organizers of EDAC Now, which is now a project of Know Your Nine. And we were the folks who were actually behind getting the Department of Education under President Obama to better enforce Title IX. And so we were able to, I think, thanks to the power of, of online support, and we got over 110,000 signatures in support of what we're doing, um, really helps be an impetus to what we saw in terms of like the Not Alone Report and um, the general support, unfortunately, that we're seeing the backlash to today. And so um, one way I think I want to characterize the backlash or sort of the recent changes under Secretary DeVos is unfortunately, it does seem very much a part just of the general whiplash or re, like going backwards to any sort of changes that did happen under Obama. But what is really not known is that um, the Obama era guidelines, they're not introducing new things, right? We as activists and as students, we were just acting for the department. We were asking schools to do their jobs. And so it was over, what we were asking, what the guidelines already said, were things said by other administrations, conservative or um, Democrat, asking for this is how you properly prevent and respond to sexual violence. And so I would say if we're thinking about next picture and what to do as we move forward, we really, the truth is on our side. And also the people are on our side. Uh, there was a recent poll um, done in conjunction with the National Women's Law Center that overwhelmingly said around 90% of respondents supported Title IX protections for sexual assault survivors. And so while maybe the media is putting it out there that a lot of people are not for these rules or these protections, but folks do believe that the right to an education free of sexual violence seems like a pretty reasonable thing to have. And I think that is what gives us the power to be able to um, really assist students of all identities because a little bit related to what Wanda was speaking about with marginalized survivors is that 
for me, especially as, um, you know, I'm a first generation American, I'm a black woman, and I was a scholarship student, and I could not access the same type of resources as of uh, most of my classmates, right? I went to Tufts University, um, where tuition back then in like 2006 was $50,000 a year. So very different um, aspects and just different power dynamics. And so while um, Betsy DeVos did revoke those guidelines, there are things are not totally lost. And I think that's really important to say is that while Betsy DeVos um, have, has changed a lot of things, we can do things at lower levels, as well as in terms with the federal level. So we can start from a little bit more local, looking at what a specific school's um, policies are and their practices. There was a recent uh, lawsuit actually against Betsy DeVos and the Department of Education and Acting Secretary, um, Assistant Secretary Candace Jackson, and they noticed that a lot of schools are now just flat out ignoring any rape reports or they're very much delayed in responding. And so if you see that or if you heard about that on your campus, I think it's, this is time to pressure local schools to step up. It's not just about compliance. It's about also doing the right thing. It's about protecting students, right? It's the job of administration to make sure that students have the best circumstances possible for them to receive the education that they attend, like, that they intend to get when they went there. And so that is why Title IX is so powerful and so important. And so looking at what's being, what's happening, looking at the policies and knowing that just because the bottom line says, um, the bottom line from the government says you have to do X, Y, Z. That does not mean the schools do not have to go above and beyond or they can't go above and beyond because policies do have to be different from school to school to really address the needs of different students and, and different populations and different locations. And so looking locally, I think, is a very good first step. Um, I also think on the national stage, what we're seeing, I mentioned a little bit about that lawsuit against the Department of Education and keeping an eye on that. So um, there is going to be a rulemaking process, um, like con notice and comment, essentially, and there's gonna be rulemaking. Um, and folks, it is, this is gonna start in March, 2018. So basically in a few weeks and make to fo follow what's happening and make sure to put in those comments and showing how important it is to have these Title IX protections when um, there's just a lot of myths out there that are being pushed, right? The idea that the Obama era guidelines were against due process, which is not true. Actually, the guidelines were enforcing due process. Um, and if you look at federal court uh, proceedings that were suing schools for improperly uh, enforcing Title IX, and when the assailant says that their due process was violated, when, even when the courts agreed that due process was violated, they also explicitly said it was because they did not follow Obama era guidelines. It's because they, the schools messed up and they weren't providing due process. And so it's just little facts like that, I think are super um, important to know that, you know, the truth is out there. Unfortunately, it's just been really hard to find. I very much recommend checking out Know Your Nine, nine as in IX. Um, dot org. They have a lot of resources for student organizers and other folks who just want to know what's happening because we very much are in this very uh, nebulous time and we don't know what's going to be happening um, and when. And there's also been some efforts on the state level. I think it's really important to see um, some activists and advocacy groups are trying to get the Obama era guidelines codified into law, at least at the state level, to sort of start in um, that movement back towards um, increased protections. And so looking at what's there, um, supporting any measures, contacting your representatives, these are all things that could be really um, helpful and really powerful. And I think it's really important to emphasize that while it, a lot of activists may feel very discouraged or it may feel like it's completely gone, but I think, uh, or it's all just already been done, but I think this is just something that we're beginning. 
And it's important to not feel like it's all hopeless and that we do have a lot of power because it's only been about one year and there's a lot of things that are happening that are going to be catching up. Um, and we do have the climate on our side, especially with Me Too and its rise, which has been really um, astonishing because I remember when I was assaulted and tried to get like talk to the media or get some sort of attention. And this was about in maybe 2008, 2009, and no one really cared. No one covered my story. No one cared about the systemic abuses that we hear about. And I think it's really important to remember that you may only hear one story, but very often this is part of a broader problem. Um, this is why we have to keep in mind that very often the most marginalized students, the most disadvantaged students, are harmed more often, or they come from communities that are assaulted at much higher rates. And that's something that is important to keep in mind. And so using this new era to our advantage, I think is very um, helpful because just so many more people are talking about it. And that is really what we need. And that's why we have all these uh, facts out there and there's actually a little bit of a recent win while it's not related to campus sexual assault but I just read today how Maryland finally is allowing uh, rape victims to file to take away parental rights from their assailants. This was something that was on the books that victims could not even ask, they couldn't request it and now it finally was passed and a lot of the advocates who were in support of this said we really believe that the Me Too movement really helped push it forward because people just don't want to have those bad headlines or seem like they don't get it. And so um, I will kind of just emphasize again, like checking online, knowing the facts, but we are in a very, um, we're in a really pivotal time. And I think hopefully that while um, the Department of Education has moved away from Obama air enforcement, it's also important to remember that while those were revoked, they were actually based on previous guidances that were not revoked. And so there, this is why we're also kind of in this really weird legal, um, you know, fuzzy space. And so I think definitely keeping up and watching with uh, what's going on is important and taking action, whether it's locally on a national stage and in between is really what we, um, which is really important for us to do. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, I think I'm not quite sure who is in our audience today, but um, the SCRA community more generally, um, we often talk about sort of focusing on research, but also focusing on action and wanting to blend those things. Um, and this panel originally came about because folks, I think, were um, wanting to know more concrete ways that they could get involved um, with what's going on. So I wonder if you have any suggestions. Um, I know that you gave some already about, you know, if things are going on at your local university, definitely getting involved there. Um, but maybe some ways for SCRA members to keep up to date um, with what's going on and with sort of activism either in their area or um, at the federal level. You mentioned Know Your Nine is a great resource and I wonder if you have others that come to mind. I think you're still Sorry, muted. I muted myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so Know Your Nine, I would also say National Women's Law Center, uh, Serve Justice, S-U-R-V, Justice, and um, Equal Rights Advocates, E-R-A, that they are in California. So these are all very um, helpful organizations that are kind of at the forefront of trying to at least especially in the legal sense and around these guidelines to educate people, check out their blogs and their social media to see what they're saying. And I think that will be very helpful in terms of just keeping up to date with what's going on, what's the research behind it, and what's the reality aside from what we may be seeing in op-eds and um, random newspapers. Uh, I also would recommend um, there are, if folks are thinking about um, 
I, I mean, I, I, I was going to recommend a book and I can find the exact title, but that also just talks about how to use guidelines that are um, in practices that are really mindful of marginalized students, especially in this time, because it's still very easy for us to fall into the same patterns where we kind of only pay attention to a certain sort of victim or we inadvertently uh, start practices, right? I think it's kind of related to cultural competency as Wanda was talking about, like having practices that might work very well for a certain part of the student population, but unfortunately just isn't um, always the case for everyone. And that may actually um, make it even worse um, and, and, and exacerbate the trauma or the situation or the help that they need to be. But I would say that it's um, the organizations I mentioned um, their blogs and just what they're putting out there. It will be, I think, or keep an eye on them and follow. And if you sign up with Know Your Nine, they actually have a place where they will notify you when the rulemaking process opens and they'll keep you updated. And so I think that will be a really helpful resource for uh, folks. Great. Okay. Um, and I'll start with asking for audience questions um, specifically for you, Wagatwe, and then we'll move into sort of an, a more open Q&A um, with all of the panelists. So does anyone in the audience have a question? We'll give them just a minute in case anyone's typing. I'll also put a link to the book I just mentioned. It's called Intersections of Identity and Sexual Violence on Campus, Centering Minoritized Students' um, Experiences. Great. And it looks like we do have someone raising their hand. Okay, um, so we have someone who submitted a Q&A um, at the bottom, so I'll just go ahead and read that aloud. And I'm not sure if this is directed to a gateway or to the uh, panel more generally, but um, the question is, our policies are very much focused on the student needs. I know that's not always the case, but I'm sorry to hear it's so non-normative. If it would be helpful, uh, Oh, it looks like perhaps someone already answered this question. Sorry. Uh, I'll just finish the rest of it. If it would be helpful for you to hear more about how it's working for us, I'd be happy to talk and follow up, at least in a background conversation capacity. Um, okay, so sounds like this is a private Q&A that we'll follow up on um, after later in the webinar. Thanks for submitting your question. Um, any other questions? We'll open it up to all panelists now. Um, so any questions from the audience uh, for anyone in the panel? Um, and I think either raising your hand or submitting it via chat is the most uh, effective way for those questions to come in. I'm not saying anything. Okay. Um, well, I had a question that I wanted to follow up on, if that's okay. Um, so, Wanda, you mentioned you were talking about um, looking at what community organizations are doing as well in this space and kind of working with them. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more to um, how collaborating with community organizations can be helpful um, for those who are working on campuses, um, the extent to which you see that happening and potential advantages to doing that? Yeah, I think um, in general, as someone, as I said, stated earlier, someone who started in this field as a very lost soul uh, with, a <laughs> with more questions than answers. 
and being able to connect to uh, community organizations like the Mississippi Coalition Against Sexual Assault, um, the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault, um, being able to see um, in capacity as someone who considers herself to be a mentor of those folks who are doing that work also. Um, but being able to, to understand, uh, g gaining a better understanding of, of what impact looks like, uh, I think that it is uh, very easy, um, especially when we're looking at the, the various dynamics of, of um, collegiate institutions and the culture. It's very easy to get caught up in the bureaucracy and being able to uh, work with um, to work closely with the group and, and, and to understand what strategy looks like uh, when your partnership on an everyday basis is a very larger um, scope of, of bureaucracy in that way. Uh, being, able to, I, I, being able to be mentored for me specifically um, in, by, by a group of women who were uh, changing the face of support for people of color in Mississippi for survivors of uh, sexual violence um, in university settings in the South uh, and utilizing uh, the understanding of the impact of grant writing, the impact of uh, partnering with other coalitions, the impact of utilizing your voice and your platform um, on college campuses and, and just being able to weave a, um, a, a, a support network in that way. Um, I, I definitely look to, uh, whenever I move to a different um, state and I'm doing this work, I definitely seek out training opportunities first, right, within uh, our community settings. I want to know what advocacy looks like uh, from, from in, in a larger sense, what, what it looks like, what the resources, what those services look like. Uh, within the college bubble, <laughs> uh, there are times where resources are very, very specific. Um, and being able to connect to such a wider range of resources uh, across um, the state or across larger communities is only benefiting your students. What you're doing is you're developing a wider net of resources for your students. Um, because uh, as an advocate, what I know is I have students who say, I need to, I, I, I am interested in mental health resources. I can't go to the counseling center. I don't want to I don't want to be in a waiting room with people who know me. I don't want to have to, that is an added layer, right? Um, and being able to connect them to resources in the community who are able to give them that level of care as well as the level of anonymity that they're looking for. And that's just very, you know, in the grand scheme of the value of that relationship building, that is very small, but that's very impactful. Um, and so, and just using that, um, example but when we're talking about brainstorming and having conversations with people who know how to have these difficult conversations and being able to work to um, strategize on how to grow um, with with little or how to grow with with a promise of little right i think that there are areas that uh, we can definitely um, benefit from and I wanted to, I was going to say, if it's okay, I wanted to piggyback off of something that you just said. Um, so one um, sort of nice thing is, is uh, uh, with institutions um, sort of helping students connect to community resources is that even if federal guidelines change around confidentiality and mandatory reporting, they can't manage. So for example, the 2014 Q&A specifically encouraged campuses to make victim advocates on campus confidential, but a lot of institutions were not actually doing that, which is a big problem. But if you're partnering with a community organization, they can't dictate what they do and they can be completely confidential. So that's another really great thing about um, sort of facilitating partnerships between institutions um, and community resources. Great, thank you both. Um, did anyone else wanna jump in from the panel on talking about collaborating with community resources um, or sort of thinking about this on campus versus in the community more generally. Okay, any other uh, questions from audience members coming in? 
Um, I know we had intended to have a, a panelist, LB Klein, who is going to speak to um, sort of give an overview of recent policies. Um, and so if that's something that you are looking for, um, again, Know Your Nine is a great resource for that. Um, I know that that came up a lot on the original SCRA listserv of sort of what, what exactly is going on, um, how can we find out more about sort of the policy piece of that. So um, there are some good online resources for that. Okay, I'm not seeing another question come in from the audience. Um, since we do have a panel that represents sort of research to practice to activism, um, I wondered if any of the panelists wanted to speak to um, challenges that exist in, in either um, kind of getting research to practice, um, communicating, um, going the other way and looking at um, practices that have been developed sort of on the ground from different universities and how do we take those and um, evaluate them um, and maybe bring them to other universities. Um, do any panelists want to want to speak to that and sort of either challenges that you're seeing there or really good examples um, where things are going well in sort of bridging that research to practice or practice to research gap? I mean, I, I guess I could say, I, I mean, I, I guess I've seen a lot of examples where it works well, right? I mean, I think it's about dialogue and conversation, um, which is, I think, something that um, Scra talks a lot about. But, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's I mean, the, the panelists here, I mean, I think everybody was really talking about research and practice and that it needs to go both ways and people all need to be in the room. I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, the only reason that I started studying bystanders is because I was in the same room with our statewide coalition and the head of our campus crisis center, <laughs> right? I mean, they get full credit for being super smart about that. And, and they, you know, they were the ones who'd really been thinking about it because a lot of practitioners had been talking about it. And, you know, they said, okay, who can we find that likes to do research who could who could do some program evaluation, who could figure out more about what was going on with this. And so through some emails and some online focus groups and, you know, we got a little more of a broader conversation started um, and, um, and, and there it is. Right. And so I, I think, I mean, I, that doesn't, that doesn't belittle that there are challenges because there are, there are only 24 hours in a day, sadly. Uh, <laughs> And given all the great work we've heard about today, like I, I'm convinced that maybe some of my colleagues have found a way around that and I want to know their trick, especially Wanda. Um, <laughs> with all those things you're doing. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, you know, um, but I think that if people are genuinely have some common goals, and I think when we talk about things like campus sexual assault, I think people who do research on it, people who are doing practices around it, it's not very hard to find common ground that we're all trying to end violence, right? And so I think then even though we don't always have the same language and we have different lenses, I think we can be open to, to learning from one another. And I, I know, for example, I see that in my work with campuses um, who are campus grantees all the time. I mean, how they're finding classes where professors are doing a research project and they make evaluating a prevention program, the research project, or, you know, um, so I think that, I think that, that those are really good examples. I, I guess, you know, my hope would be that campus climate surveys are another place to have those conversations. I think there's probably a lot of variability there with, I think, probably some campuses having a lot of interaction between practitioners and researchers and administrators in terms of designing and owning that data and what you do with it. Um, but I think that um, there are probably lots of examples of where that is, that goes less well. So I think it's, I think it's just about communication and finding those common goals and, um, you know, trying to find those extra hours in the day, which I think is, is hard um, because nobody has it. But, but I think it, when we're all passionate about a topic, like I think, 
folks um, on the webinar are that I think that's where you find those spaces because you learn so much, right? I mean, I'm super lucky that I had Grace Mattern and Elizabeth Plant and these folks who said, let's talk about bystanders. Okay, I'll get data and let's talk about it. I agree. I, I think that um, I, I think I look at the I, I look at the relationship that I have with um, our, our research components, various research components across campus. First of all, we will not be able to survive without Rollins School of Public Health and they and their students who are just amazingly vigilant and. <laughs> They are, they possess a, an, an energy. Uh, we are a very small office. We're an office of three full-time staff members. And that is major because that was, that was not the case, um, not even uh, two years ago, not even a year ago. Um, and so, but being able to have a relationship with Rollins School of Public Health uh, and, and looking specifically within uh, leaning on the relationship that we can have with researchers, those who are interested working um, in uh, working on this, the Senate subcommittee for the prevention of sexual violence is an opportunity to bring in a coalition of folks. We also have another campus, right, that's 45 minutes away uh, and brings not only Atlanta campus, Oxford campus, uh, it brings in our communications, it brings in our um, our research folks uh, on the topic who are studying uh, interpersonal violence, it brings in our student groups, um, our peer advocates, it brings in our college council, right, our SGA students, so we have these opportunities to have that. Now look at the relationship with that group in the way that I look at the relationship as, as an advocate with first responders. We all have the same goal ultimately, but we look at how we get there and the methods that we take to get there may look very different and it may look very foreign to a point where we're like, yeah, that's not my lane. That's not at all how I do my work here. But I think if we if we continue to create an environment that um, allows for this appreciation of these varied uh, experiences, I, I, I think th this is how we're able to continue to do the work that we do. Okay, thank you both for speaking to that. Um, I'm not seeing additional questions uh, come in from audience members. Um, one of the other things, I think um, we're scheduled to go until uh, three o'clock today, but um, I know we are down one panelist from what we had planned for. Um, and so maybe we'll wrap up here in the next few minutes, but I wanna make sure that we do give an opportunity for anyone who has questions. Um, to to speak up. Um, and one other question um, for Wagatwe or for other panelists who want to speak to this, um, given what you were talking about in terms of sort of the current backlash that we're seeing, um, and you mentioned that the information and the truth is out there, but that it can be hard um, for people to find that. What do you recommend when you're sort of faced with a lot of misinformation? How can we communicate um, through that misinformation and try to um, get people to a place where we're, we're at least agreeing on some basic facts or trying to correct things that maybe have been misrepresented in the media or by um, by others, how would you kind of frame conversations around that? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> I mean, it's, so it's really, uh, it's been quite frustrating, unfortunately, because the information is out there and there is so much research, but not everyone can access it. Or if they do, they don't necessarily um, understand it, which I think is, has become some bit of a barrier. Um, can you just repeat the main point of the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting yeah, a word from like. 
Yeah, that's fine. Um, I guess my question was just sort of broadly, um, what are some strategies that you use for combating that kind of misinformation? Mm -hmm. And maybe what are some things that we can think about doing as either academics or practitioners um, to combat things that we see in the media that are that are inaccurate or or that are representing one side of this? Um, what are some strategies we can take? Yeah. So um, I like to think of myself as like first and foremost a, story, a storyteller, um, and I think there's very there's a lot of power in folk stories, and not necessarily just the stories of individuals, but how they're said. And so I think if there is information out there, really thinking about how to be strategic and how these stories are being told, whose stories are being told, and how, and sort of. I think there's no shortage of information out there that is very um, in, misinformation out there, right? I think it's very prominent. It's been out there. It's pushed. It's a lot easier to find, unfortunately, than the than the truth. So I would say also following writers who've been writing about this and say it in layman's terms that's easy to understand is really important. Um, looking at very common talking points that you see about different topics and really writing them down and putting out like really um, being strategic in terms of how you counter them. And so I'm going to find a, um, there's this uh, organization called the Center for Story Based Strategy. And even though, even if you're not necessarily telling a story, I think it's really helpful in terms of looking at what the other folks are saying um, seeing what the problem is, seeing what the truth is, and being able to create that middle ground where you're creating a narrative that is actually based in truth and facts and um, isn't using misinformation or a mission to reach someone's, um, you know, their, their end goal. I'm going to find a link for that and I can send. Great, thank you. I wondered if any other panelists had any thoughts on that combating misinformation in general. <laughs> I, I can't say that I, I think it is, I think one of the, the major ways that I do is I, I take the time to unplug. Um, sometimes the best way to combat is to unplug, gather yourself, especially if you're someone who's engaged in this, um, in the movement in a, in a very active way. It, there are times where it, when it hits and it hurts um, and it definitely uh, impacts you. And so I, I, I always do self checks and just to, just to say, hey, yo, Hey kid, where are we today? You know, what are we doing? How are we feeling? Like, where where are we feeling these sensations? What do we need to do? Where do we need to go? Um, and sometimes the the most important thing that I can do for me is to step away <laughs> because um, fake news. Um, I have a reaction to it in a way that if I do not take that space because I know what it is and we all know what it is. Um, and we know that it is minimizing the voices uh, and in times the bodies of those who are suffering. And I just, I, I have no place for it. I just have, I have no capacity to keep it, carry it anywhere. And so there are times where it, it just gets to a place where the best thing that I can do is, um, create distance and, and sometimes that is that is a very useful tool and when I'm rested and when I'm ready I come back in and I work to um, I, I, I work to create create balance um, I am a I think using uh, the tools that you have at your advantage, right? Uh, social media, there are some folks who use their social media platforms to keep up on their kids, to send pictures to granny. Nope, that is a tool that I use to kind of balance out. Um, I think that um, I also specifically, uh, I use the art form of petty as a form of political resistance and resistance to misinformation in general. And so I think it, it's figuring out what it is that you 
um, what is it that you particular you particularly have at your disposal that you can use as a platform to kind of balance out uh, misinformation in general? And just to add to that, I think it's it's so interesting hearing all of you, Gatwe and Wanda, and everybody talking about this. Um, it's been it's been an interesting afternoon. It's great to be able to spend some time with colleagues and thinking about these things, but. Um, a program that I've been part of evaluating is a high school program that's a bystander intervention program around dating violence, but it has a really solid component of media literacy in it for high school students. And so I think that's one of those silo busting places um, where the more, I mean, I just love the way everyone is reinforcing this message of these interconnections and that we need to be thinking about lots of forms of violence and other forms of oppression and also thinking about other kinds of prevention strategies. I mean, you know, so um, tobacco prevention has used media literacy as very effectively. And I think that violence prevention is a little later to the game around incorporating some of those strategies, but I've seen it used pretty effectively in this high school program. And so I think um, I'm interested in some of the ways and innovative ways that we might also think about putting some of that actually integrating more into our prevention activities because I think then it can have these kinds of ripple effects that everybody's talking about. And also in our training, so I know uh, we uh, just recently created a 20-hour trauma-informed care training um, for uh, specifically at that time for some students uh, for a student research group in Rollins who were conducting a research experiment that um, that included them working specifically with survivors of violence to ask questions around um, how campus climate surveys around the topic of violence, how it impacts them. And they wanted to make sure that those who were uh, uh, the, the, those who are part of the research team had were trauma informed. And so we did this 20 hour research, uh, 20 hour training, and there was a huge portion on how we tie oppression to media perceptions of difference and media perceptions of um, of race and ethnicity, right, and culture, and so we were able to use like um, one of the one of the more one of my favorites articles is the article of the the young woman who died in a cocaine apartment, uh, and I was like, what's well, a cocaine apartment, right? And how these letters, how these, uh, I I, it feels, I just like saying it, like, cocaine apartment. Um, I it. It is interesting the language, uh, how we use language um, and how that can be used to reinforce ideas and stereotypes around specific groups and how that entails, how that messaging system feeds into uh, systems of oppression that could uh, impact how violence happens, right? So I think that that's a way uh, to kind of combat that as well. Great, thank, thank you to all the panelists. Um, so we, I think we have time for a couple of final questions if anyone has them uh, from the audience. Um, and I also wanna say that panelists, if you have questions that you'd like to ask each other, um, we probably have time for maybe one or two of those. And if not, then we can um, definitely facilitate that conversation after the panel ends. I just wanted to thank everyone. I really, I learned a lot. It was, um, it was great. And Mackenzie and Scraw folks, thanks for organizing and moderating and everything. It's, it's, um, was nice to, speaking of time out, right? It was nice to just take some time out to hear from colleagues as opposed to my usual, like run from meeting to meeting and answer 50 email in between. So this is great. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for your time today. Um, we will, we have recorded this session and so the um, SCRA administrators who are on the line can uh, maybe speak a little bit more to where this recording will be available. Um, but again, I just want to say thank you to all of you. This is um, a big chunk of time to give uh, to this and so we really appreciate that. And thank you as well to the attendees um, and uh, I hope that you all have a great rest of your afternoon. We'll go ahead and um, and end the session now unless the scrad